Rio Rancho, New Mexico. It's one of the fastest growing cities in the southwestern United States. Once a tiny suburb of Albuquerque, this city went from a population of a couple thousand to a hundred thousand in under 40 years. As you drive through Golf Course Road, you'll pass several churches. There's one church that is unique. It may look like your average church building, but it holds a powerful story of God's blessings within its hallowed walls. Join us as we turn back the pages of time, examine the small church on a mesa. In 1980, Mesa Baptist Temple was established by Bill and Becky Price as a mission out of Temple Baptist Church in Albuquerque. The first services were held in what is now St. Pius High School in Albuquerque. Services were then moved to the Italian American Club in Rio Rancho. There were some really faithful, dedicated men in the church that were determined to make it work. They were running maybe 30, 35. Uh, when they were in that Italian American club, it, it looked like everybody was in the choir and it looked like there was maybe 30. Shortly thereafter, the present property was acquired and construction began on the first building. Today, this 2,700 square foot building houses the church offices and a classroom. My sisters and I called it the Little White Icebox when we first moved here because it was just a dirt road on golf course and that was the only thing out there. It was just a white square. And we came from a very big church back in Dallas. So when we drove up, we were surprised it was so small. It was unusual to have services in there because the front of the auditorium was uh, towards the door to the hall. And so if anybody wanted to go to the restroom, they would go right straight in front and everybody would watch them. And you'd wait for them to come back then they would go like that. So we were here about two weeks and my husband swapped it. We put the, the podium on the other end so people went to the back. It became apparent that God was blessing this tiny Mesa Top mission when it began to grow from just three families to around 60 members. Unfortunately, the devil would execute his first attack on the church. 1983, Pastor and Mrs. Price's marriage fell apart and they divorced. Brother Price then resigned as pastor of Mesa Baptist Temple. I really appreciate the sacrifice that um, Billy and Becky Price made to start the church. They came from Temple Baptist downtown and they came out and it was nothing out here. It was just the Mesa, but they had the desire. They had uh, a vision of a church being on the west side and and I appreciate them because that's hard work I mean there's no building there's no money there's no people and and they were willing to take that and, and work and they got families in and they started they started the actual building on Golf Course Road and and they weren't here to see it completed but they were here and I think uh, it, it was too bad that that they left so soon before it was finished and, and they sacrificed a lot to start that. And when we came in, it was just, it, the, the building um, was good and we just went from there. This baby church was tasked with finding another pastor. Enter Jeff and Jody Carr, a young staff couple from Texas. We were working in a church in Austin, Texas and it was my brother-in-law's church that so he was the pastor and my husband was the associate and he my brother-in-law surrendered to be a missionary to Japan so he was leaving and he said um, we need to look for a church to go to so he must have called around called some friends or whatever and heard of this church in New Mexico we called and they said sure come on out and so we came out it was a Sunday morning and Sunday they voted Sunday night they called us we went back and packed, and we were back here in two weeks. Shortly after Jeff Carr became pastor, the devil took his sights again on the church, and this time he almost destroyed it. 
In the spring of 1984, the observance of the Lord's Supper was about to be set. Several of the members had taken an issue with Pastor Carr over how the supper should be administered. The methods they were suggesting were very unbiblical, yet Pastor Carr stood firm on God's word. The problem with that was um, people came into the church that were not Baptist, and they had different ideas how to do the Lord's Supper. And when my husband preached about this is God's way and stuff, they didn't really, they didn't really want to do it that way. This resulted in Mesa Baptist's first and only church split with half of the membership leaving. Instead of doing what God said, they says, well, we'll just go somewhere else. And, and, and they just sort of went to all different churches, but they didn't go to another Baptist church. They were, some of them started their own, some of them went to a totally different denomination. One would speculate that this calamity would greatly impact the church's survival. However, this was not the case. What left us with was a good core a good core of solid Baptists. And that's, I think, when we started to grow. So much so, the building in which they held services quickly became too small. The second auditorium was then built. Almost all of the labor was provided by church members. The concrete flooring was already there. It, that was the basketball court outside. And so all we had to do, there was a wall, so all we had to do was three, three sides. So we raised some money. And as we got the money, we did it. And I think it took us maybe a year and a half to complete it. But we had the people in the church, they volunteered to come put the walls up, come put the roof on. I remember I was in there helping hold the sheetrock up while they were nailing it on. I mean, we just all took a part in it. And as we got the money, we, we finished it. So when it was finished, it was paid for. My dad and mom helped out with the fellowship hall. I don't know exactly what they did, but my sisters and I would go up and kind of stay out of the way and play in the dirt um, while they worked. But I don't really recall specifically what they helped with, but everybody pitched in. It was really nice having services in that building compared to the small um, auditorium that we had in the original building. Um, you could have 10 people in there, and because the acoustics are not very good and everything bounces off the walls, it sounded like you had 100 people singing. So that was actually really cool, because um, it always sounded very full. Um, I really liked it, it was a lot of fun. God continued to bless the church, and the tenants began to grow even bigger. In order to accommodate the overflow, the teens would have to meet for Sunday school at the Happy Days Daycare Center down the road. They were running probably <clears throat> 50 to 60 kids. And in fact, they got so big and we ran out of space that we had to bus them down the street to the daycare. And every Sunday, they'd meet, pick up their folding chair, go get on the bus, go to the daycare, then unlock it, spray some air freshener around, sit down and have a lesson, pick up their chair, put it back on the bus and get back for church. And they grew. They grew during that time. That's crazy. And, and now we've got all these nice facilities, air conditioners and stuff, and, and they, we have a hard time getting them to come. So it's like the harder the situation, the more they thrive on that, I guess. I don't know. Being in the teen department was a very unique experience because um, Rick Korsma was my youth director. And that always um, made for a very exciting end never quite knew what was going to happen with Brother Rick. So um, it was a unique experience, I have to say, and I think he would agree. We were his guinea pigs, so I was one of those kids in his first youth group. It was a lot of trial and error, I think, for him <laughs> and for us, <laughs> but it was a lot of fun. Mesa Baptist undertook the biggest building project to date, a massive 10,000 square foot auditorium and children's area. God had supplied the resources through the offerings of the faithful members, so now it was time to build. With a big building project, the only thing I really remember was playing volleyball on the foundation and the steel beams were up. Um, and I would come up with my dad and he would help out whatever was needed. Everybody pitched in. That was always was really nice about both the buildings is that um, it was obviously a smaller congregation, but everybody pitched in and did whatever was needed in order to get the work done. 
It was probably a couple of years before we actually got into it. But once we started it, it only took probably six or eight months to do it. Uh, because we had people coming in and doing the steel and people coming in, of course, the concrete and uh, all that stuff. But when it got to the inside of the building, we kind of helped out there. I stained 30 doors and then I came back and varnished them all. With the church producing so much spiritual fruit, the devil once again took aim at the church, specifically the new building project. A group of city officials were stonewalling the new building project to the point that they took Pastor Carr to court. Pastor had no choice but to place the matter in God's hands. They didn't want any more churches in town because they had already given land to First Baptist, Rio Rancho Community, Catholic, and they thought that was enough. So they did everything they could to keep us from getting permits. They said, we don't need another church in town. But we did it anyway. I guess they expected us to back down, but they don't know my husband very well. He does not back down. God was victorious. The court ruled in favor of the church, and the construction continued as planned. In the end, every single city official came head to head with God's wrath. Uh, some, some of them had some really bad things happen in their personal lives. And it's like, you don't mess with God's church. You need to let God do his thing or else you're going to be in a lot of hurt. And, and some of them had accidents, children died and stuff. And it's a, you don't want to mess with God. On August 5th, 1990, the first service in the auditorium took place on the church's 10th anniversary. We had about 400 in there, and there was like standing room only, and it was um, very energetic, and we had a great song service. It was really, really a, a fun service to be in. It was exciting for all of us to see that and smell the new smell. That was pretty cool. The church had a Bible institute that gave any willing church member a Bible college level training. This gave men like Rick Corismo, Adam Fierro, and Charles Clay a doctrinally sound opportunity to learn more about their faith without having to attend college. My husband started the Bible Institute because he didn't want the guys to go off and pick up their family and their, sell everything and go to school. And We had a couple that did that when we first moved here and um, they got to college and messed up and divorced and quit the ministry. So he says, well, maybe we should do it ourselves. So I think that's what kind of got him started with it. And, and a, a lot of the, the guys got strengthened from that. And, and of course, Brother Cosmo needed to be grounded a little bit in his uh, Bible versions. And, and some of the guys had been coming to church, but they didn't have any you know, deep knowledge of the Bible stuff. So that's, I think that's why he started it. And so a lot of, a lot of guys went through some classes and it was good for them, it was good for the church. Corismo, a staff member, pastored in both Utah and Texas after his time as a youth pastor at Mesa. Brother Rick was a very unique individual. Um, he was really young. He looked really young. I think he was early 20s, but he looked like he was about 16. He looked like he was a teen himself. Um, he was a lot of fun. He had a lot of energy. He was extremely vociferous, did not do things quietly, made it known how he um, expected you to be bold in your witness and your testimony at school. He, um, he harped on that um, and really pushed us to talk, talk to our friends and invite them to come to church. And he um, actually had a, uh, he had a Bible study at the high school, at Cibola High School. Um, he was very involved in the lives of the teens. He wasn't just a youth director. I mean, he really got to know us as people and really invested in us. He invested in a lot of the teens. Fierro was a deacon, song leader, and youth pastor at Mesa Baptist for many years. In 1997, God called him to start New Life Baptist Church in San Ysidro, New Mexico. 
where he has been pastoring for the last 22 years. Adam, he was really good. He was good with the teens. And uh, the teen department is one reason why we, we stuck around and came over. And Janelle really liked the teen department, so. Janelle was 12 and she felt very comfortable there. I believe I was a junior or a senior in high school when Brother Adam took over the teen department. And it was, it was a lot of fun too. He actually helped Brother Rick when Rick was the youth pastor, so it wasn't like he was unfamiliar to us. He just kind of stepped in and filled the void. Um, so him and Miss Pam were a great, were great youth directors. 1987, Clay and his family received Christ as their savior. After the Lord led him out into Mexico, he eventually became pastor at Gospel Light Baptist Church in Blythewood, South Carolina. Recently, he took a church in Florida where he is now pastoring. But he was in 100% and my husband made him deacon, and he was the best deacon. He had such a heart for the church. It was nice to see, to see how dedicated they got and how they wanted to continue. And of course, God called him to preach another one, and he felt like that's what God wanted him to do. So, of course, he left with his family and stuff, and now they're, they're in a really good little church. So we're, we're, we're glad we get to see how God's blessing them. With the turn of the millennium, Mesa became 100% debt free. It's nice to be part of a church who, when we need something, we can pay for it because our people are our givers. God has blessed them because of that, and uh, we can help missionaries and other efforts that uh, need help. So that's, that's really a good feeling to have our buildings all paid for and be debt free. The 2000s were met with new blessings as well as challenges. The church's name was changed to Mesa Baptist Church for Mesa Baptist Temple. It kind of became a source of, you didn't want to say that temple part. And the reason they put temple on it is because we were, um, we were started out of Temple Baptist Church. And that's why they stuck the temple on it. And it was an honest thing that they wanted to do, but it just kind of grew into a, um, um, identifying us with another. So we just kind of slowly put church on there. In 2006, the Giordano family joined Mesa Baptist Church. Brother Stephen Giordano became a deacon in the church, and he and his family became very active ministry workers. They're a yeah. great family. Yeah, they're a yeah. great family. He's yeah. really good. I like, like the whole family. He started uh, the security team, gave us the ideas, started uh, the police appreciation, which grew and grew each year. He mm -hmm. had the vision for it. I remember when the Giordanos came, and I remember that they visited for a really long time, and I had just assumed that they had become members because they had been coming so faithfully for so long. And I was surprised when they joined the church because it had been like a year or later when they decided to join. But um, because they were always faithful and attended the services and were always there, so you just assumed that they were already members because they were kind of already um, dialed in and trying to help in any way they can. Feeling the Lord's call to preach, Giordano moved his family to Texas and served under Stephen Foster at New Heights Baptist Church in Wiley, Texas. Finally, in 2015, Giordano became pastor of Trinity Baptist Church in Grand Prairie, Texas. The Giordano's um, is a good family and it took them a few years to get in. They, they knew our church and they had some issues in their past and it, it, they had to overcome, but they did that and it's just like, when that happened, they just opened their, their hearts and lives to whatever God wanted them to, to do. And he surrendered to preach, and God had to put him through some trials, and then he's finally got a church and doing a great job. Great job, got a good family, good, good church, and, and when you walk in it, you think, that looks like Mesa Baptist Church. The 2010s were filled with many new ministry ideas. Love Works, started in 2014, is a boots on the ground outreach ministry. Through simple acts of kindness, this program promotes the church through gifts such as hot dogs at the 4th of July parade, donuts at the bus stop, and gift bags to guests. I have participated in Love Works going out to the soccer fields 
and passing out hot dogs and passing out tracks and uh, going to the 4th of July parade. Love Works was our church theme and I think that's the one thing that's continued on past that year, which has been a really good thing that they still continue that because it's a, I think it's a really good way for church members to get involved, but it's also a really good way just to get out and meet the community and show them that, you know, we care. It's been neat to be part of that. Yeah. yeah. It's been a good outreach, I think. And it's been enough things that we could pick and choose what we think God would have us be involved in. We've done the, the hot dog and at the park, hot dogs at the park. Oh, yeah, yeah. I cooked a lot water. of hot dogs. <laughs> yes, you cooked a lot of hot dogs, yeah. Grow, or God Rewards Our Work, a visitation outreach ministry started in 2017, was created to fit the strengths and abilities to every single member willing to join this group. Well, it's good to um, have people involved in different areas. Some write cards and letters, and I know some send to the missionaries, meeting the new people that visit. Yep. I think them getting visited by someone who's not uh, being paid by the church makes a big deal. And I don't think a lot of churches do that kind of outreach. So. And they'll make phone calls if people are absent and all that's, that's good. So there's a lot of different things that a person can do to participate and grow without it being just a visit. And the goal is that you come and you feel comfortable you writing these letters and cards and maybe you're not comfortable visiting, but maybe in time, then you feel comfortable and you'll be willing to go out with someone to visit and then you can learn how to visit and learn how to be a witness and how to knock on doors. And that's really the ultimate goal is to teach people to grow and how to visit, but also going out and reaching people and um, seeing people get saved. That's the, that's the main priority of GROW is to see people get saved through the program. During this time, God gave Mesa Baptist a new challenge, reaching the Rio Rancho Police Department. This introduced the annual Rio Rancho Police Appreciation Day on the Sunday after Mother's Day. Police Appreciation Day is a really uh, special event that the church puts together because it really is a way to say thank you to the Rio Rancho Police Department and a way to show our love to them and not expect anything in return. And I've seen through the years how um, their attitude has changed towards us. Um, I think I would say probably around year five, I was serving in the under the tent, the meal to the officers and their families, and I could really feel a change where there wasn't, kind of the guard had been let down a little bit and they were more willing to talk, they're very appreciative and more willing to kind of open up to you and talk and so you could see that they were starting to be comfortable and that took time for them to feel that. But through each year, I think it, that, you know, that, um, that sense of comfortabil comfortability and that sense of knowing that we're here, really here just to show them that we care and to say thank you, it grows with every year. And we had so many people involved in that. We probably had 50 to 60 people involved in every area of that day ministry, getting everything done. And it's really neat how everybody will do their part and it all falls together. You know, it, everywhere from media, food, check-in, music, every area of it, everybody did their part and it and it just flowed. It just flowed. They kind of didn't know what we were doing the first year. It was learning by doing it and he had the vision and then Pastor caught that vision and, and just took it further and it's been a good ministry. Pastor's done a good job with the police chaplain and reaching out to the police officers. He has a heart for them. I've seen some saved out of it. Um, I think they trust us more. They see that we have their best interests at heart. We're not wanting anything for it. We just want to honor them. For four decades, Mesa Baptist Church has stood like a rock for the Lord. They have faced trials and tribulations, but God has always stood by his church. I think in any situation, whether it's good or bad, it all falls on good leadership. And I think Mesa Baptist has great leadership. And I think when um, Pastor steps in and handles the situation and it's not um, spread around that means it's dealt with behind closed doors and that's how it should be dealt with um, to where it's not trickled down and 
gossip's made. You know, it's not made and turned into gossip. But there were some of the rough spots you went through. I'm not, I'm not going to say which ones they were, but there were some rough spots there. That the church came through, all right. Pastor Carr handled it right. Mm -hmm. so, maybe not 100% right, but he was on, on key what he was supposed to do. He was he tried to follow what the Bible says. Yes, that's important. Uh, you're always going to have bad. You're always going to have people that hurt you. <clears throat> and you can't quit every time somebody hurts you. Um, and, and I learned that at the very beginning. I, would, I wouldn't have been here six months if I'd left after somebody hurt me. You have to look at the good, and, and God is so good in every area, as far as the church, your life, your friends, your family. God has been good in every area, and um, no matter, it, you're always gonna have bad times, but you, you gotta overlook that and let it roll off your back. Though over 2,000 souls saved, 1,000 baptized, over $3 million given to missions, and over $10 million given offerings, it is evident that God has used Mesa Baptist Church in miraculous ways. But you know, when my husband was working uh, before we came here as an associate, as a youth pastor, as whatever, whatever, um, we went from those nine years, we lived in about 10 different places. And so by the time we got here, it was like, my husband says, I think I can do this. We knew nothing when we came here. We were just excited to be here, you know, let us, you know, we just did all this stuff and we learned as we went. Spiritually, we, of course, we have grown. We've grown and, and there's some things in our personal life that we've gone through that made us stronger, that um, maybe if we were somewhere else, we might not have learned it like God had wanted to. But uh, we, we, different things in our life, God has put in our life and we can see it build upon each other and we can see that God's used every, every step. For me personally, Mesa Baptist Church has been a huge part of my life. We, my family and I started coming to Mesa Baptist when I was 10 years old. Um, Jean Baker was my Sunday school teacher and I got saved when I was 10. You know, when I think about Mesa Baptist from like the beginning to where it is now, I'm actually pretty pretty amazed. It's pretty incredible because I know what it was like when it was just a little box, a little white box. When I walk through the church now and I see um, sometimes just memories will come back like I'll see like oh there used to be a wall there or oh the door used to be over there not there and so it always just kind of reminds me of what it used to be like and so so thankful that it is where it is now but also the people, there's so many people that have come through the doors of Mesa Baptist Church. When I would lived away for eight years, I came back to a whole new group of people. I mean, for the most part, I didn't know a lot of the people because in that time period, people had moved away and more people had come in, which is great because it means more people had gotten saved and more people had committed themselves to the Lord. And so there's always kind of like a revolving door, but to think about all the people that have come through. Um, God was moving us from another church, and uh, we started with close to home. We didn't know Pastor Carr. We had heard some things, whether they were true or not, we were going to find out for ourselves, but we knew good people that went to that church. Well, you can ask Pastor Carr when he first came, and we, we sat down in his office, and I gave him a third degree. <laughs> we asked about what they believed and things, and we were satisfied, and we were going to visit other churches after that. And we never did. <laughs> it's a loving church, it really is. So, yeah, we have most of our friends are there, yep. and uh, our hearts are there. Our daughter was 12 when we came, yep. and she made sure of her salvation there. Was baptized, married there. You know, we have a lot of history there. So it's like family. Yeah, That's what we is, tell people when we deliver yeah. the chips and salsa. We always tell them our church is like family. We appreciate that we have all age limit, uh, age groups. We have all ethnicities, races. It's like a big family. <laughs> it's exciting to see what he has in store for them in the future. May Mesa Baptist Church continue to stand for the Lord until his coming.